Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's simply begin with prayer at this point. Merciful Father, it is your grace and mercy that brings us to this moment. This moment of Ash Wednesday, this moment of the beginning of Lent, where we get to spend the next 40 days contemplating and thinking about what you have done for us on the cross. What a marvel your salvation is. What a joy it is to be your children and to grasp and to think about your salvation on our behalf. We ask for your blessings on our worship this evening. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Almost as soon as I saw the general theme for this year's Lent season, my, my mind was actually quickly turned to the issue of trackers or to, if you would, the world of scouts, especially in the old world. You see, in the days before mechanization, when people traveled about on horse and buggy and on foot, there were people known as trackers, or if you would, scouts, who could literally follow exactly where you had gone. Seriously, to read tales of how accurate the ability to read a trail was is, is absolutely remarkable. I feel it's probably a skill that's long lost by most. And I say this because if you're like me, I couldn't track you in a snowstorm, let alone follow your trail in the middle of a green forest. The idea of our theme is that we are going to track Jesus. Our general theme for this season will be his final steps. We are going to follow his footsteps as he is headed to Jerusalem. There he will complete the mission he had come for. It will be an awesome journey with a number of stops. At each of our stops, our desire is to learn and to grow in the knowledge of our Savior. Our specific theme for this particular night of worship is his final steps led to a dinner celebration. And I think you will be as surprised as I was at the text before us. I can tell you that when I first received and read the theme for my Lent sermon, I simply assumed that the dinner celebration was going to be that celebration that took place in the upper room. I couldn't have been more wrong. Our text is John chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the hometown of Lazarus, who had died the one, Lazar or the one Jesus raised from the dead. They gave a dinner for him there. Martha was serving. And Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about 12 ounces of very expensive perfume, pure nard, and anointed Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume but one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was going to betray him, said, Why wasn't this perf perfume sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He did not say this because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. He held the money box and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus replied, Leave her alone. She intended to keep this for the day of my burial. Indeed, the poor you will always have with you, but you will not always, you are not always going to have me. The large crowd of the Jews learned that he was there. They came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priest made plans to kill Lazarus too, because it was on account of him that many of the Jews were leaving them and believing in Jesus. Now, before discussing the specifics of this text, let me mention that this particular history is also recorded for us both in Matthew and in Mark. And of course, there are some slight differences in what they record, but with really nothing of major difficulty. For instance, both Matthew and Mark record this history right after they mention the plotting of the Jewish leadership that took place just two days before the Passover in Jerusalem. And that actually leaves the impression that the dinner took place at that time. But you have to understand, the Jewish leadership was always plotting to kill Jesus. Please note that in their planning, they made it clear that they did not want to do this during the Passover feast because they had a fear of the people. And that fact just goes to show us that the best laid plans of men have no impact 
on what the Lord God himself wants done because Jesus is going to be crucified during this Passover. But note that as Matthew and Mark go on and record this event of the dinner and the anointing of Jesus, they don't specifically give it a time, if you would. Their intent in their writing is to show that, was going to, that what was going to take place was clearly the plan of God. But as John records the event, John is more intent in making sure that the details of the event are clearly known because John wants you to know a few other things of importance in this history of Jesus. And we'll try and make sure that you get all the lessons. What should we know? Well, first, know that John is reporting what is the correct time. This event takes place on the night before Palm Sunday. Please note there's lots of hubbub about Jesus because a month or so earlier, Jesus had raised Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha, from the dead. That miracle caused many to begin to follow Jesus. It was especially after that miracle that all the more aroused the hatred of the Jewish leadership. And it's in connection with that, that healing, that raising of Lazarus, that Caiaphas, the high priest, had said, you know nothing at all. You do not even consider that it's better for us that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. From that point on, the plotting of the leadership heightened, including the desire to kill Lazarus. So Jesus kept his distance from them in order to make sure that his father's plans were going to be fulfilled. See, all those facts help us to grasp why we are told that, at this special, that this special dinner was not done at the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, even though they were in their hometown. Rather, this dinner is actually held at the home of Simon the leper, as he is called. That's because Lazarus' home was probably being closely watched. So this dinner party then is at Simon's. Yet note that Martha is serving and Lazarus is certainly reclining at Je with Jesus at the table. Remember, this is the night just before Palm Sunday, that day of Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem and his final week before death. There are lots of people on the road, and it's clear that Jesus uses those crowds to hide, to hide his movements, well, at, at least for now. <coughs> So we learn there is a dinner party. Jesus and his disciples are certainly involved. No doubt they are the guest of honor along with Lazarus. But dear people, that is not the marvel that God wants you to contemplate for right now. What God wants you to think about is what is now going to happen. God directs your attention to Mary. It is John who tells us that it is Mary who anoints Jesus. Both Matthew and Mark simply describe her as a woman. And I think they do that because at the time they wrote their Gospels, persecutions were beginning to break out. And so they don't say it's her to try and protect her. But John, writing his Gospel much, much later, knows it doesn't matter if he names her or not. And it's just an indication to us that every, everyone knew Everyone knew it had been her. What does she do? Listen again to the simple record of John. Then Mary took about 12 ounces of very expensive perfume, pure nard, and anointed Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. Now please note that Matthew and Mark both note that Jesus' head had been anointed too. We're told that the whole house was filled with the fragrance of that perfume. Why? Why would she do this? I'm going to sum up her act with these words, honor and love. She wanted to honor Jesus. You have to understand, anointing is usually done for royalty, or anointing is usually done for those who are, were of high priestly offices. Well, in truth, as you and I know, Jesus was both. He is the Son of God, though you couldn't tell just by looking at him, you couldn't tell the depth of his divine nature. We do recognize, though, as the Son of God, note that Jesus had, had come to fulfill that very important role of 
the great high priest, really the last high priest this world would ever need. And I don't know exactly what Mary understood about Jesus. I think she knew he was a great rabbi. I think she knew he had raised her brother in an amazing feat of power. Personally, I think she just wanted to honor Jesus in the best way she could at this point. And she also wanted to express her love for Jesus. Again, this is the man who had raised her brother back to life. This is the man who had taught her to go after the important things of God. And if you would, I think she felt she owed Jesus this display of love. I say that because of what we know. Well, it is true that when Jesus had been at their home one other time, Mary sat at Jesus' feet to learn, and Martha was distracted by her serving. And we all know that story. And we all know how Mary looked like such a faithful child of God. But did you know that in the history of Lazarus' dying, when Jesus approaches the town, it is Martha who runs out to greet Jesus. Martha expresses trust that Jesus can still help, and it is Martha who then and there declares that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Martha has to go back to the house and tell Mary that she should go to Jesus because he is asking for her. And when you read that history, it's clear in the text that Mary is upset with Jesus because Jesus didn't get there in time to heal Jesus, or in time to heal Lazarus. Jesus didn't get there to keep him from dying. And she says as much to Jesus. Actually, it's, it's the only thing she does say to Jesus. And as you're reading that history, you'll realize it's Mary's distress and the distress of those around her that causes those simple words that we hear. Jesus wept. And now the power of Jesus is displayed and Lazarus is raised. And it's clear Jesus has power even over death. But because of her lack of faith, her doubting of the goodness and power of Jesus at that time, I think Mary especially, wanted Jesus to grasp how her love and her trust in him had grown. And so she wanted to take this opportunity to show her honor and her love for Jesus. And might I mention that to dry his feet with her hair would have been an act of deep humility on the part of Mary. And again, letting Jesus know how utterly and absolutely important he was in her life. Not a bad example for you and me to follow, is it? How is it that you honor Jesus? How is it today that you show your love and show how utterly important Jesus is in your life? I mean, seriously, could I look at your life, and in looking at your life, could I conclude Jesus is deeply important to that person? Here's a good question to ask. Is Jesus the daily companion at your side? Or is Jesus just the guy whose house you mostly manage to get to maybe once a week? It is the honor and the love of Mary for Jesus. Is that honor and love of Mary the honor and the love that you have. Now we go on with our history. Here is this beautiful act of honor and love for Jesus, and what do we hear? And again, our text. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was going to betray him, said, Why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? 
He did not say this because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. He held the money box and used to steal what was put into it. <laughs> Those are disturbing words, aren't they? And by the way, our initial reaction is just, just to grit our teeth and wonder what in the world was wrong with Judas that he would have such an attitude. But listen to what Matthew says. But when his disciples saw this, they were upset and said, why this waste? This perfume could have been sold for a lot of money and given to the poor. Wow. But listen to Mark's account. But there were some who were indignant and said to one another, why has this perfume been wasted? Certainly this perfume could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. Then they began to scold her. In truth, it seems that many of the disciples were upset at this waste of such an expensive product. Please note, John merely pinpoints Judas as the one who causes the indignation of these men. And again, you and I, we want to say, what is their problem? Well, they haven't been listening. They haven't been paying attention because for the last six months, maybe the last nine months, Jesus has been telling them he was going to be handed over to the chief priests and Jewish rulers and that he was going to die and that he was going to be raised from the dead. They have been told these things. And had they been listening to Jesus, they would have realized that the time for his suffering and death was now. But I'm going to tell you, oh, oh they, were, they were all wrapped up in ministry. They were busy being disciples. They were busy hanging around with Jesus. They were showing people how cool they were because they were so involved and they were such excellent and good men. After all, they were followers of Jesus, but evidently they failed to listen to Jesus. And instead of recognizing the love and honor Mary is giving, they are upset because as Judas said, this could have been sold and, and the money given to the poor. And in a way, I, I can see how the other disciples could end up agreeing with Judas at this point. In truth, Jesus and his disciples, they don't, they don't have a lot of money. Remember when that tax issue came up? How Jesus had to send his disciples out, the fishermen disciples out, to get the coins out of the, uh, for the tax out of the fish? Personally, I think that had this perfume been sold, and the money given to the poor, it would have been the biggest act of financial charity they had ever done. It would have been great. Except for the fact that in less than a week, Jesus is going to be dead. So instead of focusing on that and the importance of that, as Jesus has been telling them, it's clear the disciples are just showing how little how little they actually grasp what Jesus is about. And again, that's it's kind of like Christians who go about being Christians, but they keep forgetting and they keep leaving behind the point and the truth of Jesus. They want to spout off about all the good things they do as a church or as individuals. They want to tell you about the missionary work that they're doing, about how they feed and they clothe the poor, and how they are, they're leading souls to be filled with love and, and obedience to Jesus. And in doing so, they leave much about Jesus out. Because they forget to talk about Jesus on the cross. They forget about being, that being a Christian is, is what Jesus has done for you and not what you do for Jesus. And I'll ask, do, do we do that? Do we get involved in ministry and doing and being? But in the meantime, we end up leaving the heart and the core of our faith behind? Because we forget that Jesus is the point. Listening to him, listening to what he will do and what he will accomplish for us. 
And by the way, it's here that John mentions that Judas is a thief. Really has such a, a sad note. Clearly, Judas has long ago stopped listening to Jesus. And I want you to remember, he was chosen as a disciple because Jesus saw his faith and his hope for the Messiah. But it's now clear that Judas has turned his attention from Jesus to the purse, to the money, maybe even to the fame and the wealth that he hoped would be his as a disciple of Jesus. And, of course, now that's all proving not to be true, isn't it? And again, the point of our faith is Jesus. And it is clear that for quite some time that has not, not been the focus of Judas. And I have no doubt, had the other disciples known this truth of Judas as a thief, they would not have jumped so quickly on his false bandwagon. And it's Jesus who puts it all into perspective. He says, leave her alone. She intended to keep this for the day of my burial. And Matthew and Mark are even more precise in what they say. They say this, why are you causing trouble for this woman? She has done a beautiful thing for me. You are always going to have the poor with you, but you are not always going to have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Amen, I tell you. Whenever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what this woman has done will be told in memory of her. Jesus chides his disciples, chides them for their lack of insight. He points out to them what, she, what should have been obvious to them because he's been telling them that this was all coming. He was not always going to be with them. The poor will always, always be in this world. But Jesus was not going to always be physically present in this world. And now here is where we need to be reminded of exactly what Jesus is going to do. Jesus is going to end up on the cross, not because he was some sort of rebel, but because he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. He is going to suffer the wrath and the horror of his father's anger for our sins. Jesus is going to pay, eternally pay, for the sins of the whole world for our sake. His agony is for us. His wounds and blood is for us. His dying is for us, and his burial, which he mentions here. His burial is the burial that will break the hold of sin and death that's upon us. Because Jesus will rise. Jesus will rise. Well, Jesus will suffer and die, but Jesus will rise from the dead as the absolute proof that he is our Savior, our Lord, our God, who in grace and love grants us the opportunity for forgiveness and eternal life. Did Mary understand all of this? I, I doubt it. But Mary did get that Jesus is the most important man to ever walk in this world. And you know what? She's right. Jesus is worthy of our best not only the best of our hearts and minds, but even the best of our possessions. Jesus is worth it all because Jesus is our Savior, our Lord and Savior from sin. And please note that here we are some 2,000 plus years away and we still speak of this act of honor and love from Mary because Jesus was right. The gospel was going to be going out to the whole world, and that good news of our Savior as it went out to the whole world always brought up this memorial gift of Mary, still remembered some 2,000 years later. The disciples, well, the disciples once again show the reason why Jesus had to say to them numerous times, why do you have no faith? Faith is about Jesus, about what he has accomplished for us, 
And if we are not listening, if we're not hearing, if we're not following Jesus, we're going to end up being just like them on this night. I pray this Jesus, this Savior is your Savior, and that you treasure him as much as Mary did. For he will die for you. He will rise from the dead just to save your soul. Lord, thank you for showing us the events of this dinner party that we might all the more believe. Amen.